During the election campaign of 1906, we had intensified our propaganda. Wherever the would-be cabinet minister went, there were also the militant women. Sometimes there were two or three in a meeting, sometimes only one. I was chosen to attend one of Winston Churchill's meetings in St John's schoolroom, Deansgate, Manchester, rather a rough district, where pretty lively meetings were expected. We had become quite adept at making our little banners, a square of white calico with the slogan, Votes for Women, painted on them in black enamel. We always took several, as they were often snatched from us, and we had to fight hard to retain one of them. With two of these inside my court, I arrived at the meeting in good time with a friend. While we waited, a gentleman sitting near asked if I thought Miss Pankhurst would be coming. Why? Is she going to speak? I asked innocently. Oh, no, he said. She doesn't come for that. Haven't you heard about these women who go about upsetting meetings? Conscious of my intentions and the two banners I carried, I answered cautiously that we did not live in Manchester and had only come in for the meeting, which was true enough in one sense, whereupon he kindly gave us a resume of the doings of the militants since the free trade hall meeting in October. If I had not been so nervous, it would have been amusing. But I knew what I had to do was no laughing matter, so it was not difficult to assume an air of grave interest in his account. When the meeting commenced, I waited anxiously for Mr Churchill to be well underway with his speech, and then I rose and displayed my little banner, calling out, Will the Liberal government give the vote to women? At once, the meeting broke into uproar, shouting, Throw her out! along with other less decent suggestions. My banner was snatched from me, and clutching hands tried to pull me over the seat. But I was young then, and strong, and pushing my assailants away, I mounted the seat, held up my second banner, and repeated the question. The chairman seemed unable to do anything, except to make wild gestures of rage. So Mr Churchill himself took a hand. Appealing for order, he said, Let the lady come to the platform and tell us what she wants. My immediate attackers at once gave way, but I was subjected to much rough handling on the way that I must have looked a sorry sight when I reached the platform. The chairman, who seemed entirely to have lost his self-control, seized me roughly by the arm and literally shook me until Mr Churchill interposed, saying he would deal with me himself. With his usual forcefulness, he induced the meeting to give order and invited me to state my case. In spite of my agitation, I did so, saying briefly that we wanted the promise of a government measure granting the vote to women, as it is, or may be, granted to men. Having said this, I made to leave the platform by the steps in front, but was roughly told by the chairman to go off at the back. This I refused to do, knowing that Adela Pankhurst had been locked in a classroom for several hours the previous night. Do go, my dear. Go out, said Lady Randolph, who was on the platform, and appeared to be distressed. Eventually, Mr Churchill asked me if I would leave by the back, on his personal assurance that I should be escorted immediately into the street. There I found my friend, who had gone out to get help, fearing from my rough passage to the platform that I might have been seriously injured. She had collected several men who had been prepared to go in and do a bit of rough housing on their account if I had been injured. But we all felt that Winston had been pretty decent and left it at that. We were not so fortunate at all the meetings. At some, the women were badly knocked about. But on the whole, I was fairly lucky in escaping ill-treatment. Along with Alice Milne, a young Manchester girl who was secretary of the WSPU, I went to a meeting addressed by Lord George at Hale in Cheshire. This was a ticket meeting, purposely designed to keep out the suffragettes. But there happened to be a fair number of socialists in the district who had more in common with us than they had with Lord George, so we had no difficulty in getting into the hall. Here, we found a large audience singing with great gusto... Why should we, the beggars, with our ballot in our hands? Oh, or without it, I whispered to Alice, who had begun to laugh at the curiously inept serenade. 
Our male friends carefully dispose themselves about the hall, ready to do a bit of heckling on their own account. It is a tribute to Lord George's oratory that I was really reluctant to interrupt him. Not that I was impressed by the views he expounded or the liberal millennium he promised. But a good speech is, to me, what a fine piece of music is to the musician. And in those days, Lord George was undoubtedly a spellbinder. But when he ended one of his finest periods with, What greater freedom could you want than this? I called out, Freedom for women! We rose and displayed our banners, trying to ask the usual questions. When the cry rose from the shrivelous liberals, Throw them out! There came from all parts of the hall the demand, Let the women speak! This from our friends, whose tactics we now understood. That's them socialists! Turn them out! yelled the discomfited stewards. But a dozen or so determined men are a different proposition to one or two women, and the chucking out became a difficult matter. Lord George, finding he could get no further hearing, left hurriedly for the overflow meeting. We were kept in the hall until this was over, the result being that we missed our train and had to walk six or seven miles to Alice's home, where I spent the night. We had to concentrate on the leaders, not yet being numerous enough to tackle all the candidates. But in Ashton, I got together a deputation to interview Mr H. Whiteley, the Conservative, who had held the seat for ten years, and A. H. Scott, the Liberal, whom I had not met since his pioneer days in Bolton. Both received us courteously, promising support in a suffrage bill, came before the House. Mr Scott, however, said he went further than us, as he believed in adult suffrage, but we knew the adult suffrages by now and paid little heed to their suggestions that we should work for the larger measure. Let those who want votes work for them, was our answer, having no mind to get our heads broken, as the women did at Peterloo, in order to get more votes for men. When the election day came, we decided to picket the polling booths and appeal to the electors to vote against the Liberals, who refused to give us any hope of a government measure. This was a very unpleasant task, as we had to go singly, our numbers not being large enough to send two pickets to each station. My post was Manchester Town Hall. This was indeed an ordeal, as we're not sure whether we could be charged with obstruction, and the police were far from friendly.' 